Thank you, and welcome. Thank you to everybody for uh, attending our webinar today. I'm going to show you the first slide is the agenda for the webinar. We will talk first about the role of ingredient authenticity testing in halal and kosher food certification. We will then talk about applying real-time PCR to ingredient authenticity testing, the extraction of DNA from food for ingredient authenticity testing, finally the Kyogen's ingredient authentication portfolio, and some representative data for ingredient authentication in a complex food matrix. So the molecular food safety testing market um, is growing um, daily. Many, many more um, applications are being um, looked at in a molecular fashion. Our molecular techniques are being used for different um, fashions. We have food born pathogen screening that is very commonly used these days for the specific detection of bacterial DNA from food cultures. We're using t DNA testing for uh, looking for DNA from GMO, genetically modified organisms contained in various foods. We have both qualitative and quantitative testing applications in the market. Um, molecular tests are also being used for screening for allergens. Um, and for the specific detection of DNA from allergens contained in foods. And finally, um, the topic of this webinar, DNA is being used to verify ingredient authenticity. So looking at the specific, specific detection of plant and animal DNA uh, contained in foods. So verifying ingredient authenticity. Why would people be interested in testing um, for ingredient authenticity? Well, first of all, we'd like to look to see perhaps if foods have been cut with cheaper ingredients or substituted with cheaper equivalents as food becomes more globalized and there are many manufacturers of manufactured foods. Um, Sometimes people will uh, cut or manufacturers will cut the food with cheaper ingredients to get better, um, would you say, return on investment or at least a cheaper process. For instance, pork can be used in place of goose or calf liver in pate. Turkey can be used in products that are labeled as chicken because turkey is much cheaper than chicken. Soy or corn could be used as a filler in meat products, particularly some kind of you know a ground beef, ground meat product, a sausage or um, something like that could have soy or corn added to decrease the amount of meat that needs to be used. Another example of cutting or substitution of ingredients would be using apricot kernel paste um, rather than almonds in food that's labeled as marzipan. Almonds are quite expensive, apricot kernels are much less expensive, and they can be used or are occasionally used in place of almonds um, and labeled as marzipan. Um, another reason for testing would be to look at a pro as part of a process to check if foods meet a religious or other requirement, for instance, to um, detect or de to determine that no pork is in food that is certified halal, that there are no meat-based products contained in vegetarian food. And as vegetarian food becomes much more widely accepted or more widely utilized, this becomes a more interesting um, product or an, inter an interesting finding. And finally, to assess animal feed for contamination, um, certainly with the specter of BSE perhaps again um, coming into the market, it's very important to determine that there are no animal parts being used in cattle, sheep, and et cetera feed, and to also to determine that food has the appropriate content with no filler added so that you get what you're paying for as a consumer. Halal certification of food. So what are some examples of considerations for halal certification? Well, in halal, or to be certified as halal, animals and animal-derived foods ingredients must be um, slaughtered according to the uh, religious rules. There are specific um, rules for slaughtering um, animals for meat, and these must be followed in order to consider that the meat is halal. Food may not be or contain meat or byproducts such as gelatin, lard from swine, and birds of prey. 
for plants and plant-derived foods and ingredients to be uh, determined or to be certified as halal. Um, fruits, vegetables, and nuts that are not intoxicants are permitted. Um, prepar- preparation methods and other concerns. Utensils and dishes may not come in contact with non-halal food. So if you use dishes, utensils that have been in touch, have been in contact with non-halal foods, this would render the food non-halal itself um, because of traces of non-halal food. So these are um, considerations. And the food may not be contaminated with intoxicants um, or certain minerals and non-halal foods and byproducts. Again, for instance, cheese cannot contain rennet from non-halal cattle. How is food certified halal? Well, food producers are certified halal by national certifying bodies. For instance, there is a halal monitoring committee of the United Kingdom. There is another body in the United States called the Islamic Services of America that does halal certification. Um, Malaysia Halal Foods also certifies foods as halal. And these are just examples because there are many, many more um, throughout the world. Um, the certification process is is that the food producer who wants to have the food certified as halal submits an, an application and an ingredient list to the certification body. The source and the preparation of the ingredients is checked for compliance. For instance, that the butcher and the meat that's butchered is compliant with the um, religious rules. The facilities do not allow contact of halal and non-halal foods. And occasionally, a certification laboratory may test for non-halal content, for instance, for pork. Um, also, it becomes in, it's interesting to note that as food, uh, the food market becomes more and more globalized, that uh, certification for a halal becomes more essential for the import of food. So part of the process of export or import of food is to also de- certify or, or also to well, to, to uh, check for the certification of that food as halal. And sometimes there may be other tests that will be done. So examples of consideration for kosher certification, um, similar to halal, the animals must be slaughtered according to the religious laws. They may not contain, be or contain meat or byproducts from swine, horse, or birds of prey. This is very important in looking at gelatin and lard, which are frequently ingredients in a wide variety of food. For kosher um, determination, shellfish and other water invertebrates are not permitted. Plants. Fruits and vegetables must be free from insects. Presence of insects will render a food non-halal, non, non-kosher. Excuse me. Um, the origin, age, and growth conditions of plants are significant in, determine, in determining whether a, a plant, fruit, and vegetable is in fact kosher. Um, preparation um, methods and other concerns are also of utmost importance for kosher certification. Dairy products and meat products must be completely separated prepared in different areas, and prepared with different and separate utensils. Kosher certification um, is done, there there are several very large bodies. The largest of them are in the U.S. Um, One of the largest um, certification bodies would be the Orthodox Union, perhaps Star K, Um, but these are very large bodies that um, will certify food as kosher. In the certification process, a food producer will apply to the agency, say the Orthodox Union. The agency will evaluate the ingredients and then also the production facilities for compliance with kosher regulations. And once you obtain um, kosher certification, there is ongoing rabbinical supervision of the plant. Um, Challenges for kosher certification are source tracking and the identification of chemicals and where they're derived from to ensure that they are in in fact derived from the proper source. Um, Kosher certification, interestingly, is um, viewed as an indication of quality. and more and more foods are receiving kosher certification because um, things like vegetarian, vegan, or organic food looked for purity of food 
and then look for the kosher certification to set standards for food purity in the uh, in the industry. A broad range of products might need assessment, and this is a long list which we um, do not need to read here, but there are um, many different food products is the point um, that you see here. But then also other agents that will re- might need assessment would be cleaning agents, uh, nutritional supplements, vitamins and minerals, what is the source of these. Cosmetics frequently require halal certification um, that the uh, oils and, and um would you say fats that are included in cosmetics are derived from the proper source. Packaging is frequently a very important uh, consideration that the packaging must be um, certified in order to ensure that the food is not coming in contact with a non-halal or non-kosher food wrapping, food packaging. So how do we apply real-time PCR to ingredient authenticity testing? So what can real-time PCR do in terms of um, halal and kosher certification of food? It's very important to understand that real-time PCR cannot fully replace the complex investigations needed for halal and kosher certification, but it has the potential to support such investigations. So again, it cannot replace the complex investigations needed, but it has the potential to support such investigations. So it's another tool in the toolbox of certification. Real-time PCR can detect even trace amounts of DNA in a sample. The tests are rapid, sensitive, specific, and reliable. So if you are looking at a food to see if there is a small, is any trace amount of DNA from a, um, for instance, from pork, the test can determine that for you and be a part of your investigation. Real-time PCR is already used by the laboratories of some halal certification agencies to test for traces of pork in ingredients in manufactured foods. So what is PCR? What is polymerase chain reaction? And this um, slide will tell us in brief what it does. Um, It's a cycle, and we first heat denature the template to separate the strands of DNA. Once those strands of DNA are separated, you can anneal a primer. Primers would be labeled by the red and blue arrows. The annealing is done at 60 degrees. We then extend the primer, which means we copy the template um, at 50 to 70 degrees. Once that's done, we then repeat the cycle. So by the end of 40 to 45 cycles, we have many, many, many copies of the DNA of interest, and we will have copies of just the DNA in here. Um, In in other words, the DNA of interest is copied many, many times, and... um, You get um, DNA that you can then put into a, um, you can then detect with a reaction. So you can start with very slow, very low amounts of DNA, use the PCR reaction, get many copies of the of the DNA, and detect even low copy low amounts of DNA. Okay, real time PCR and food safety testing. It is specific. It detects only the target sequence. It is not detecting other sequences. It is sensitive. It can detect low copy numbers of DNA uh, contained in your sample. It has high inhibitor tolerance, so that even if you have inhibitors, your PCR reaction in food should have a high tolerance for inhibitors. It's rapid, easy to set up. The detection is under 90 minutes, and standardized um, testing uh, is very important. You can automate the protocols. It's a stable chemical design, and you know that from sample to sample and from test to test that it's the same thing. The Maricon PCR assay portfolio, so Kyogen's um, portfolio, food portfolio was called Maricon. It's the, the label, the trademark here. So our assay design. The Maricon product line features harmonized cycling protocols for all types of testing. So we have harmonized protocols for pathogens, for GMO, and for ingredient authenticity at this point. Um, There is a major advantage in workflow setup when your assays are set up in the same way. You You can set up a wide variety of tests all 
in the same fashion at the same time, and you get um, you know simple simple setup. The workflow only differs in the sample preparation method. We have one sample preparation method for uh, bacterial pathogens, so from overnight cultures of food in um, enrichment media, and then we have another sample preparation method for obtaining DNA from food, and that would be the, the um, kit we will talk about shortly. It is possible to combine analyses for different targets in one run. So, for instance, if you wanted to look at um, corn, soy, and pork in the same in the same run, you could do that. Um, you could do because the uh, harmonized cycling protocols allow you to do that. The cycling protocol, well, the PCR volumes are 20 microliters, 10 microliters of template, 10 microliters of assay, or master mix here. Then the cycling protocol it has a PCR activation step that happens once in each um, assay. And that's five minutes to activate the PCR enzyme that's at 95 degrees. A three-step cycling protocol denaturation for 15 seconds at 95 degrees, annealing for 15 seconds with the rotor gene Q or 23 seconds with other cyclers, and that's at 60 degrees C, and an extension um, step for 10 seconds at 72 degrees. And then this repeats, the three-step cycling protocol repeats, and we have 40 cycles for pathogen detection or 45 for GMO or ingredient authenticity. And all of this, again, is harmonized across the portfolio. How do we extract DNA from food for ingredient authenticity testing? The food, our Kyogen's food safety testing workflow covers um, all steps from sample disruption through DNA purification through PCR analysis. We have automation solutions available as well as consumables or kits available. And the focus of the next slides will be the DNEZ Maricon Food Kit, which is our um, protocol for extracting DNA from food stuff. Food stuffs. Okay, what are the benefits of the DNEZ Maricon Food Kit? It's rapid. It's an optimized version of the traditional CTAB protocol. It takes just two and a half hours. It is convenient. It's suitable for all types of, types of sample material, so it's a one-for-all protocol. There is one common lysis procedure. We do have protocols for 200 milligrams of starting material or two grams of starting material. And that becomes important, especially if you have foods that have low amounts of DNA. You can start with a larger amount of sample to obtain more DNA uh, or as much DNA as possible from the food that's there. It is automatable um, we can, um, in that the bind, wash, and elute steps of the protocol can be put onto the Kaya Cube. There's efficient, um, reliable in that we have efficient removal of inhibitors. The automation allows for enhanced process safety. So Kyogen's um, kit is based on a CTAB protocol. The traditional CTAB protocol um, is very is very good. It gives you excellent DNA, and it always works. But it's very, very time-consuming, laborious, and takes about a day and a half to get through the entire protocol. It starts with a CTAB inhibitor precipitation. It's followed by a chloroform extraction, another precipitation, another extraction, et cetera, et cetera, and alcohol DNA precipitation. All of this taking about a day and a half. So we looked at that protocol and said, how can we make this work well for us? Um, and we started with the CTAB inhibitor precipitation. The first two steps are the same, a chloroform extraction. But we then took the aqueous phase from that chloroform extraction and put it onto a chiogen column purification uh, process. And we then can take that chiogen column purification and put it onto the chia cube so this part can be automated. And the end result is that we can do 30 samples in about two and a half hours. So how does this, um, or what are the results with the Maricon food DNA extraction pr protocol? One thing that we've looked at is DNA fragment recovery. Um, and this is why we've developed not only a 2-gram protocol, but also a small fragment protocol for the 2-gram. Because if the, if the food is highly processed, the DNA will be fragmented, and in many um, pro 
types of DNA purification, you do not um, recover fragments that are around 100 base pairs. So what we've done is enhance the protocol to allow for recovery of fragments of DNA that are around 100 base pairs, which are very, very small. And as you can see, the standard protocol with cornflakes is in blue. And if you use the small fragment protocol, it moves over to the left, which indicates here that we are recovering actually more DNA because the CT is, um, in this case, what, 25, 26 versus about 30. So we are seeing more DNA. Um, and it's with cocoa, we get a small enhancement as with ketchup, but cornflakes are more highly processed, and you will get better. Uh, the, and the effect of the small fragment protocol is much more pronounced with a food like cornflakes with high processing. Um, we've looked here to see the effect of the DNA that we isolate from different foods, again, chocolate, ketchup, and cornflakes, and we have used a di an undiluted sample of, DNA, of um, DNA obtained from the food, and we diluted it 1 to 10. Now, if you dilute a, um, DNA at 1 to 10, you would expect to get a shift to the right of about 3 CT units. That in, that's the effect of dilution of a DNA. Um, the CTs increase by about 3 CTs if you have a 1 to 10 dilution. And you can see this is true for the chocolate, for the ketchup, and for the cornflakes, suggesting that there are few inhibitors. The inhibitors have been removed by the protocol. And also to point out that it works for chocolate, which has high levels of inhibitors, variable cocoa content, fatty foods, um, ketchup, again, highly processed, low DNA content, acidic food, and cornflakes, which are highly processed, a low DNA content, and strongly swelling foods. And strongly swelling foods can also be difficult just because they um, adsorb all of the liquid in the extraction protocol, so we have a, a modification of the protocol for that. Foods tested with the American Food DNA Extraction Protocol include um, these that are on the left, things like ketchup, cocoa, chocolate, cookies, corn flakes, corn chips, soy lecithin, hazelnut flour, infant formula, vanilla, milk, marmalade, bread, olive oil. We've also done honey pollen, um, so many different kinds of food and different types of food from high fat content, can, content, high inhibitor content, high levels of processing, low DNA content, or very high DNA content. All these difficult and variable areas can all be done by a one-for-all protocol. Um, here we are comparing the American Food DNA Extraction Protocol with some existing sample preparation products. So we're comparing the DNA's American Food Kit and kits from suppliers 1, 2, and 3. In the blue, we're looking at peanut butter, and in the sort of magenta, we're looking at chocolate. So what we've, we've done here is using the same sample of peanut butter, we purified the DNA with American kit or with kits from three different suppliers. We find here that the American kit gave us slightly more DNA, the DNA recovery is better, um, and significantly different from the DNA recovery from suppliers one, two, and three. For chocolate, we get good recovery of DNA from chocolate. And looking at supplier one, two, and three, supplier one essentially did not recover any DNA from chocolate. The CT is uh, about 39. Um, supplier two, essentially the same message. Supplier three recovered some DNA, but not as well as the American uh, uh, DNA, the American food kit. Now, so we're looking at DNA recovery on the left side. On the right-hand side of the slide, we're looking at inhibitor removal. And again, as we've spoken, we've discussed a couple slides back, we said that if we dilute the DNA 1 to 10, we should see a 3CT difference. And it should be a positive 3CT difference front to the right. So it's a shift to the right when you dilute 1 to 10. And this is what we see for both peanut butter and chocolate with American food kit. If we look at um, supplier 1, 2, and 3, we get only a 1 CT difference, which is suggest. and for peanut butter, we have n a, a little bit of inhib inhibition carryover. For chocolate, that inhibition is much more pronounced. 
And in fact, we have a 9 CT shift to the left with sample preparation kit 1 and about 7 with sample preparation kit 2. And this suggests that there are a large number of inhibitors that were not removed by the sample preparation product that are the effect of the inhibitors is removed by dilution of the DNA. So that's an important point. And the sample PrEP-3, um, basically there's no difference, suggesting that there's a better in removal of the inhibitors, but not as great as the removal with Americon kit. So <clears throat> what is in the Hakai's ingredient authentication portfolio? What are the assays that we have available? So first of all, the workflow is that we would do DNA extraction with the DNA's Americon food kit. This is a picture of the kit. Um, and then the real-time PCR for ingredient authentication is done with the appropriate Americon kit. This is a kit here on the left. And the rotor gene Q is the instrument that you would use for the analysis. And you get reliable, easy-to-analyze results. And the Maricon kits for ingredient authentication that are now available, we have one for cattle, one for chicken, pig, and turkey, coming soon um, in about um, two months. We would find a kit for ruminant, for sheep, excuse me, for sheep and for goat, um, and these will allow you to test uh, actually for cattle feed. These would be very good for that, or for animal feed. And then for plants, we have apricot kernels, corn, and soy available. And fin the final topic is to look at representative data for ingredient authentication in complex food matrices. Um, we looked at the specificity of the assay for pig versus um, other food types, and we looked at pig. So, and wild boar, pig and wild boar are species that are very closely related. Wild boar is Suscrofa, and then the pig here is just a domesticated version. And there is um, positive cross-reactivity with both types of, of um, pig meat. And the negative targets are essentially all other animals and all other, um, uh, or all other foods. We've also done bio, extensive bioinformatics surveys, and we see no potential cross-reactions identified using in silico PCR. So both experimental verification and in silico says that the only cross-reactivity of, uh, of the pig assay is with domesticated pig and wild boar. Um, if we look at sensitivity of the assay, um, this is a dilution series going from 10 to the fifth copies per reaction to 10 copies per reaction, and we are sensitive down to 10 copies per reaction. Um, looking at amplification efficiency, we see that there is a good correlation coefficient, and this correlation coefficient is 0.9982. And finally, um, looking at the pig kit in um, a food assay, we have positive control DNA from the kit. Um, we look at pork meat that we derive from um, DNA from a pork meat sample. And then we also looked at jelly candies, marshmallows, and crackers. And in this experiment, uh, we did not find any pig DNA in any of these samples. Um, and it, we, so we were able to, to see the negative here, but we have negative samples and a positive pork meat. So in summary, real-time PCR is a specific and sensitive method that can be used for reliable ingredient authentication. Real-time PCR has the potential to play a significant role in the certification of foods as suitable for consumption by particular religious groups or individuals with dietary restrictions. And I thank you for attending our webinar.